Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? is a children's cartoon that expertly balances humor and horror. While most later installments in the franchise err on the side of comedy, Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? and its distinctive spooky vibe is what kickstarted everything. The monsters are genuinely creepy. The sound design is unsettling. And the background art is dripping with horror. Every location is dark and damp and covered in cobwebs, lit ominously from who knows what source. The grimy, worn textures of wood and stone are colored in rich, cool hues that contrast against the vibrancy of the gang. The foreboding atmosphere of the show separates it from almost any other Scoob cartoon. Someday I will make a video that discusses in length the art of Scooby-Doo, so make sure you're subscribed for that. But this video right here is going to ask a simpler question. If this show was genuinely trying to be terrifying at least a little bit, a little bit, then what is the scariest episode of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? This video is brought to you by my patrons. For this month only, I'm running a special offer over on Patreon for Scoobtober. If you support me at the $5 tier or higher, you will get access to exclusive audio commentaries. It's about nine hours of audio commentaries over Scooby-Doo TV shows and movies, including my favorite movie, Monsters Unleashed. Check out my pecs, little man. Go check it out. Like I said, it's just this month, only a couple days left, and I could really use the support right now. Would appreciate it. By the way, aren't you glad that I set up my antique Green Lantern again? A lot of you guys said that in the previous video I didn't have it, and uh, that- How are you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, and uh, Scoobtober's still going on, still a thing. I'm having fun with it. Sorry about the jump scare, by the way. Uh, that's the last time I'm going to do it in this video. Or is it? It is. I'm done. So to find the scariest episode of Scooby-Doo, I want to approach this search with some kind of logic, right? I don't want it to just be me being like, oh, it's the episode with the space kook because the, he's my favorite monster and this has the best design, so therefore it wins. No, we need some sort of fixed criteria to measure against. A formula or a Shag and Scoob approved recipe for what makes something truly terrifying. To the whiteboard. Actually, I, I'll just bring the whiteboard to you. I can't move the camera at all. So this is sort of what I've come up with here. Three pillars of what I think makes something scary, specifically what makes an episode of Scooby-Doo scary. Now, obviously, Scooby-Doo is a comedy cartoon intended for children, so none of these episodes are going to give you nightmares or anything. Take it from me, a coward. But this recipe will help us find which episode comes the closest to the center right there. Just right right in the butthole okay so right off the bat i understand that that probably sounds like it's not going to help much right like how do we find the scariest episode well we obviously find the one with the scariest monster right it's all still going to come down to my own personal preferences which isn't helpful we're trying to objectively measure art here which is a thing the internet assured me was possible so i suppose a better question would be why are horror monsters scary? This is actually something that I've talked about a lot on my channel in the past, so we'll once again turn to The Philosophy of Horror by Noel Carroll, a book that I really thought I owned physically, but I, just, I don't. I searched my bookshelf front to back. That's not how you search a bookshelf. In this book, Carol attempts to break down precisely what it is that makes something horrific. Why do we find certain things scary? The answer is much more complex than you might think at first, but to put it simply, Carol gives two definitive traits that describe what he calls, quote, art horror, to differentiate it from like, real life horror. Quote, the objects of art horror are essentially threatening and impure. End quote. That first part is pretty obvious, right? For something to be scary, it has to be threatening or at the very least, appear threatening. The zombie won't actually eat Shaggy's flesh, the mummy won't genuinely turn Scooby into stone, and the creeper just sort of shambles around with a briefcase full of money, but the gang still runs away from the monsters and civilians still speak of their horrors. Characters believe that they are in life-threatening danger. But being a threat is really only one part of the equation. Hugh Jackman is a triple threat. 
He can sing, he can dance, and he can act, and sometimes he does it all at the same time. That doesn't make him a horror monster, it just makes him the only god I believe in. So that's where the second part of Carol's theory of art horror comes in. That threat must also be what he refers to as impure. I don't super love that term, but what it means in this context is that a monster has to challenge our brain's ability to understand what we're looking at. Shaggy is a hippie, Velma is a nerd, and Scooby is a descendant of interdimensional aliens whose souls inhabit the bodies of animals. Obviously, you get that just by looking at them. That's real actual Scooby-Doo lore, in case you're not in the know. I didn't just make that up. That's real. That's what Scooby is. But then you have the Wax Phantom and the Ape Man. Their names are made up of two competing words. Which one are they? These villains don't fit neatly into a preconceived idea box that we might have. They threaten common knowledge and expose holes in our understanding of the world. They are uncategorical, which I think is a much better term than impure, but whatever. Since they are, in fact, uncategorical, of course Carol made categories to sort them into anyway. The wonders of the human mind. Firstly, there are fusion beings. These are horror monsters that are made up of two competing categories. Most notably in Scooby-Doo, the conflicting categories that make up most monsters are dead, yet alive? You've got your ghosts and your phantoms and your specters, obviously. This also applies to your Draculas, your Frankensteins, and your zombies, naturally. The wax phantom, however, is a little different. It's not necessarily the ghost of anyone in particular, but it does blur the boundary of two other contradictory categories, an inanimate substance that has somehow become animated. Same thing with the Puppet Master from episode 9. He's supposed to be a phantom, which is, you know, fitting because the episode takes place in a haunted theater. Hmm. But all he really does as a phantom is disappear once. The thing he does more of is manipulate life-size puppets to make these inanimate figures seem like they are alive, which in my opinion is already terrifying. You don't also need to be a ghost on top of that. Now, these categories don't have to be opposites specifically to count here, but they do have to group together things that seem like they're mutually exclusive. The Ape Man, for example, is part ape, part man. Maybe this Ape Man is more than an ape. Yeah, Fred, I guess the Ape Man is more than an ape. Good sleuthing there, bud. Thank you for paying attention to your own sentence. Another type of monster are fission beings. Rather than two categories combining to create one being like fusion monsters, fission beings are two categories that inhabit the same body but exist separately. Probably the most famous example of this is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, two distinct identities in one physical being. A great example in Scooby-Doo would be also Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They're, they're in the show too, episode 18. Eh, technically, he's the grandson of the original Dr. Jekyll, and he's worried that he's possessed by the ghost of Mr. Hyde. They made it more complicated than it needs to be, but hey, if that's not the through line of the Scooby-Doo franchise, werewolves are another great example of this. Sometimes you're a person, sometimes you're a wolf. They exist at different times. You get it. The other main category that's going to be useful for us here is horrific metonymy or metonymy. I never know how to pronounce it. This describes a horror antagonist who is surrounded by things that we antecedently take to be objects of disgust and or phobia. Why is the witch in episode 13 scary? I don't know, probably because witchcraft in general has a long history of being associated with a dark, evil, unnatural forces. Like J.K. Rowling. I don't know what the creeper is supposed to be, but the way he follows everyone around at a slow but steady pace makes him feel like a physical embodiment of death that everyone has to outpace as long as they can until it inevitably catches up to us all. Mortality is terrifying. You know, and I'm also gonna throw Charlie the robot into this category as well. He's just a regular robot, but the thing that makes him scary is that he's malfunctioning and unwieldy technology running rampant and causing destruction is always terrifying no matter how they plan on rebranding Facebook. Now, defining the makeup of a horror monster won't alone help us find the scariest episode of Scooby-Doo since everyone's scared of something different. You know, statistically, someone out there is terrified of the ghost of a 
Elias Kingston, even though he's just a physical answer to the question, what if Johnny Cash was blue? But with this information, we can eliminate over a third of all Scooby-Doo Where Are You episodes because they're monsters don't fit any of these categories. Starting up top, episode one with The Black Knight. Thanks to my love of Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed, I always assumed that The Black Knight in the cartoon was a ghost like he is in the movie, but nope, not a ghost, just a regular knight. And knights aren't scary, they're family-friendly dinner entertainment. Similarly, episode 21's villain is a caveman, which would only fit into our categories if he was half man, half cave. Redbeard's ghost in episode 14 technically counts, but he doesn't do anything remotely ghostly. He just sort of exists as a pirate. But I did find my new D&D weapon. Zoinks! It's the gay blade of the ghost set again! Episode three has a phantom, which does match our criteria, but it looks so unconvincing that I feel comfortable eliminating it on the grounds of it looking like a child's last minute Halloween costume. But it's not even the worst one to do that. You see, episode 22's headless specter is great, honestly, but the true villain of that episode was the phony phantom, who looks even worse than the other bedsheet ghost. His name is the phony phantom. Everyone knew he wasn't a real phantom. Now, episode 11 does have Dracula, Frankenstein, and a werewolf, which all perfectly fit into monsters that have competing categories. Unfortunately, that episode also features a character whose name is kind of a slur, so I'm going to eliminate it on those grounds. Just on its own. In fact, while we're at it, we're also going to eliminate episodes 5, 19, and 23 because these characters aren't scary. You're just racist. That was accusatory. You watching are probably not racist, I hope. Please don't be. Hey guys, hot take, don't be racist. So now, out of the original 25 episodes of the cartoon, we have 16 left to choose from as the scariest. So how else can we whittle it down? Well, we've looked at the characters, so now let's look at the setting. I went on and on and on at the start of this video about how eerie the background art could be, capturing the spooky vibes of these unfamiliar destinations. But what exactly makes a location scary? Oh no, we're falling back into the same traps. Fred would be proud. <laughs> well, if there's one obvious thing that we can take from the monsters, it's that if a location is also threatening and dangerous, that could also lend itself to being scary. Old houses falling apart, swamps filled with alligators, airfields full of sharp, rusty metal. Come on, Space Kook, I'm rooting for ya. If there's danger, there's fear. But that's not really the full picture either, is it? I mean, it's dangerous to get lost in Hugh Jackman's eyes, but I'm still gonna do it. That alone doesn't make anything horrifying. I think we can get a little bit more specific. Association with death helps. Cemeteries and mausoleums and buildings decorated with skulls. These are locations that emanate a vibe that reminds us of our own mortality. The haunted Kingston mausoleum from episode six and the witch's cabin from episode 13 are the most traditional examples of this. They also up the ante by making the gang feel isolated in unfamiliar surroundings, which is another important factor. Does the location trap the gang there? Does it separate them from civilization or from each other? Episode 16's setting encapsulates this feeling of seclusion beautifully. Not only is the gang in a haunted mansion that appears to be standing alone surrounded by a body of water, but they are tasked with spending the night there. They cannot leave. Moreover, the building is lined with booby traps that aim to separate the characters from one another. And the building is falling apart during a thunderstorm, adding back in the sense of danger. And also, the inciting event is a will reading of the former owner of that place, being yet again associated with death. This might very well be the perfect spooky setting. I just hope it wasn't anyone important who died. I am Cosgood Creeps. Attorney of the late Colonel Sanders. Not the Colonel! Another creepy crib. How come we can't ever investigate like a KFC or something? <laughs>
Is this what you wanted, Shaggy? But there's one final idea that makes a location scary. It's something that's cropped up a lot over the past couple of years, and it plays into the eeriness of the settings of Scooby-Doo more than you'd think. You've probably seen photos of liminal spaces pop up all over the internet thanks to popular subreddits and Twitter accounts and even YouTube channels. It's difficult to define precisely what they are, however. Sometimes it's the unsettling feeling of existing in a transitional space that's not meant for one to exist in. Places between destinations. Hallways are a popular example of this. Sometimes they're spaces that feel like they're on the boundary between settings, not quite belonging to something that we'd recognize. But for me, the eeriest examples of liminality are spaces that I do recognize but they're out of their designed context. A school, dimly lit at night. A silent circus, after hours. An amusement park, without a single soul in sight. These places might not inherently be dangerous or associated with death, but the gang is exploring them removed from their typical contexts, which evokes an atmosphere of unease. Something is off. Something is wrong. Someone peed in the ball pit. Is that what happened? I can't remember. You can also see that liminality plays nicely with this feeling of being alone. Being lost in a dark, abandoned theater, like in episode 9, The Backstage Rage, becomes infinitely more creepy when the one person you thought you could ask for help mysteriously turns into a lifeless puppet. Here's the thing, though. Locations are a bit harder to evaluate than monsters, for example. Nearly every episode of Scooby-Doo has a location that ticks off at least one of these check boxes. Sometimes they do more than one. And perhaps we should be focusing on episodes that embody most, if not all, of these traits, but we still have 16 episodes left, and that's a lot to get through. You know what? We're going to come back to locations at the end just to sort of wrap everything up. I think what could help us out right now is by filtering all of our episodes through one last pillar, one last idea of what makes an episode of Scooby-Doo so terrifying. And that idea is... Smudge. Was it smudged the whole time? Uh, well, it's supposed to... It's for sure the last jump scare in this video. Uh, the one, the last one that I will do. We're going to talk about jump scares in the cartoon. That's what this next section is about. It's about jump scares. I think we instinctively understand this one. We know why jump scares are scary, right? They're startling. They catch you off guard. You're expecting nothing, and then suddenly and violently something. There is a fantastic video by Scaredy Cats that goes much deeper into the usefulness of jump scares. I will link to it in the description because you should watch it. In short, they can make a film scarier, taking away your sense of security, frightening you when you least expect it. Or they can make a film less scary by providing a release of the tension that they've built up. This is why we can't, ju I dropped my marker, this is why we can't just give points to the episodes that had the most jump scares, right? Sometimes the lack of a jump scare, the lack of that release of building tension, that's what makes it scary. So what we're looking for here is not which episode does the most jump scares, but rather which episodes have the most effective use of jump scares. That can mean not using them at all and letting the tension build in a scene, or more likely it'll mean jump scares that are genuinely surprising and will rob us of our sense of comfort. Thankfully for me, Scooby-Doo utilizes jump scares sparingly. Did I mention I'm a coward? Typically you find it with that classic gag where the monster reaches in from out of frame and then the gang eventually makes eye contact with them and the camera gives us a startling POV shot of the ghoul. Other times the camera just quickly hard cuts into extreme close-ups of the monster's face as it laughs and the music swells, which is honestly very similar to more old school style jump scares, like this moment from Frankenstein.
that was an early form of a jump scare. It feels tame by today's standards, but we can see Scooby-Doo utilize similar tactics. In fact, episode 20 with The Creeper has a hard cut zoom in that looks almost intentionally similar. And this one from episode six caught me off guard. Hey, was Uncle Stewart wearing a blue suit Red tie and tennis shoes? Yeah, when we last saw him. Then I think we found him. Only he looks a little older now. Why? I guess that ghost wasn't kidding. Uh, here is an incredible one from episode seven. Watch this shot. Run, run, run. Eight ball in the corner pocket. And of course, I have to mention yet again, episode 15 with the space kook. Just try it. <laughs> I have probably seen this episode more times than any other episode of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? But there is a second jump scare in this one that gets me every time because I always forget when it's happening. I wonder where Freddy and the girls are. We gotta warn them about Ghost Man. Might as well look in here. What's that? Huh? Let's get out of here! <laughs> But remember, we're not just looking at the use of jump scares. We're also looking at times when they could have used jump scares, but refused to, where they kept that release from us. I'm saying release a lot, and I don't mean for it to sound sexual, but episode four with Minor 49er has a great scene with this. Shaggy and Scoob walk up to an old dusty bar counter and jokingly order drinks. To their surprise, drinks actually come to them. All we see is a hand shoving them along. You would think that the next shot would be Shag and Scoob spotting the creep as the camera gives us a nice close up of the miner, but it doesn't. You're trapped in this lingering moment with the duo and you don't get a glimpse of the miner until minutes later. This episode does, however, have three back-to-back -back jump scares that do make it more comedic than scary. In fact, a lot of jump scares in Scooby-Doo are played comedically, which will impact our rankings. As much as I was touting episode 16, A Night of Fright is No Delight, for having a fantastic setting that's spooky on multiple levels and the phantom shadows are terrifying monsters, its only use of a jump scare is strictly for a joke and isn't actually scary. On the reverse of that, episode 24 attempts a lingering scare as the werewolf follows Scooby and Shaggy around, but again, we see that it's mostly played for laughs. It isn't actually evoking a sense of dread. Episode 10, Bedlam in the Big Top, episode 13, Which Witch is Witch, and episode 17, I believe, yes, that's Snow Ghost. Uh, none of those have any strategic use of jump scares, nor do they have a strategic unuse of jump scares. So uh, they're all eliminated immediately, which honestly sucks because the ghost clown is one of the scariest monsters and an eerily empty circus is easily one of the more uncomfortable settings from the show, but it doesn't matter matter what I think, the whiteboard's in charge here, not me. If you're mad, you're mad at this. You're not mad at me. You're not a let, you don't be mad at me. On the note of settings though, I think we have eliminated enough episodes through our jump scare category that we can revisit this one. So from now on, we're gonna dock points from episodes that don't have at least two of these scary location traits or from episodes that completely violate one of these traits. For example, episode two with Captain Cutler's ghost takes place in a fantastically scary location, underwater in a sunken ship, incredible. But unfortunately, the episode shatters any sense of isolation by having the gang drive to a malt shop in the middle of solving the mystery. Episode 12 with the mummy, does this as well, so they're both eliminated. If you have the freedom to stop whatever you're doing and go get an ice cream, then you are never truly in any danger. At least that's what the throw pillow I bought on Etsy said. Similarly, as much as I enjoyed episode six's haunted mausoleum, the gang yet again leaves in the middle of the mystery to go check out a totally different part of town where they run into at least one normal bystander. Doesn't really feel like they're secluded. The only person trapped in seclusion is their friend Sharon, who they just left tied up as they drove away. I would probably look into getting better friends. At the very least, they could have returned with ice cream. Episode 18 has a fantastic use of withholding a jump scare when Scooby and Shaggy rummage around the attic as a shadow lingers in wait. 
but the setting is boring. At most, it checks off that it's slightly dangerous with those swamp alligators again, but otherwise, it's just a house that has people in it. It doesn't even feel that lonely or liminal. The most cursed thing is when Shaggy lets out a singular zoink. Zoink! And as much as I loved the jump scare from Episode 7, Never Ape and Ape Man, and that abandoned movie set is incredibly liminal, that's really all it is. It doesn't check off any other boxes for me. So as of right now, this formula, this recipe, I think I, I used a recipe joke in a different Scooby-Doo video, didn't I? Welcome back to Binging with Babish. Just kidding. Whatever. Thanks to this, uh, we have eliminated 19 out of the original 25 Scooby-Doo Where Are You episodes. That leaves us with a measly, a mere top six episodes of Scooby-Doo, not top six, the scariest one. You get it, you know why we're here. Here they are in chronological order. Episode four, Mind Your Own Business. Episode eight, Foul Play in Funland. Episode nine, The Backstage Rage. Episode 15, Spooky Space Kook still in it. Episode 20, Jeepers, It's the Creeper. And episode 25, Don't Fool with a Phantom. I gotta tell you, this is a pretty iconic list. Every single one of these episodes has a menacing monster, a spooky setting, and jump scares that'll make your heart pound. I couldn't figure out how to make the alliteration work for that one. I mean, sure, maybe the Wax Phantom and the Puppet Master aren't as popular of Scooby-Doo villains as the Creeper or Minor 49er, but their sets are what sets them firmly into the top six scariest episodes. I mean, horrifying hijinks at a wax museum, phantom at the opera, scary stuff, folks. But only one of these episodes can be the scariest. And according to my math, the scariest episode of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, is not the spooky space kook. What? That's impossible. What other episode could is even remotely as terrifying? Okay, you know what, that is That is fine. I can live with that one. But how did our formula arrive at episode eight, Foul Play in Funland? Well, for starters, Charlie the Robot is this unsettling, unthinking force. He's incredibly strong, so you can't trap him. He's nearly indestructible, so you can't fight him. And he's a machine, so you can't scare him, trick him, or reason with him. Unlike most of the monsters who go head to head with Mystery Incorporated, Charlie rarely goes to attack them. For most of the episode, he's just doing his own thing at a distance, sometimes altogether unseen. When the gang first arrives at Funland, Shaggy and Scooby once again get served food from an unknown source, just like with Minor 49er. Who did that? But it goes further than that. Fred plays that game where you throw a ball at some bottles, and he's delivered a prize so quickly and silently that no one there sees who did it. Should we stack those bottles back up? You're right, Daphne. Look, the bottles are all stacked up again. And what's that on the counter? It's a prize for knocking down the bottles. And our backs were only turned for a minute. Eventually, we catch a glimpse of the being that's behind this, but he's far away and moves too quickly to be human. Man, he's faster than a speed bullet. Even more curious, when Scooby tries to track the being down with his nose, a thing that has rarely failed him in the past, he finds that he can't. He can't pick up any kind of scent. No scent. No scent. He has to have a scent. Why, well, he'd have to be a ghost not to leave a scent. Uh, did I say ghost? The first time they confront the figure, he appears to look right through them, not acknowledging them at all. He doesn't grab Shaggy or chase after Scooby. He doesn't even make a noise. This differs from, I believe, every other monster from this show who moan and howl and cackle in frightening ways. The creeper's garbled voice. <coughs> the wax phantom's grunts. <coughs> the, the space kook's laugh. <coughs> God, that terrifying laugh. <coughs> Only rivaled by Scooby's weird chuckle in episode two. <laughs> Charlie doesn't do that. He just 
stares, expressionless, motionless. Suddenly, while they're there, as they're all still puzzled by this mysterious figure who keeps appearing and disappearing, the lights go out. Now, remember when I docked points from some episodes where the gang would leave the location of the mystery and go somewhere else to talk to other people, and it just sort of broke that sort of uh, isolation, that isolated feeling? Um, I can explain. Yes, the gang does leave Funland after the lights go out, but the place they go to is just a couple steps away to a neighboring house. They don't pack into the mystery machine and drive to another part of town or go get a delicious malt. It's still on the beach. It's right off the pier. And even still, this episode manages to make this feel isolating in a new way, a psychological way. This elderly brother-sister pair fully knows that there's a robot running around Funland. They're the ones who built him. But when the gang comes knocking on their door, asking questions, these two pretend to know nothing. You see, typically when the gang talks to like a local about a strange figure they saw, the local is like, oh yeah, of course, that's the ghost of, that's the ghost of pumpkin head. Uh, he doesn't have a head for a pumpkin. He just sort of has a pumpkin on his head and he's a ghost. Did I mention the ghost part? That part's important. That's what makes him scary. You get it, you've seen him. But here, the gang is met with what are you talking about? There's no one out there. There's no one. You're seeing things. Go home. The gang is still all alone. In this way, the setting of the episode definitely checks the box of seclusion but it also takes place at an amusement park after dark with no one around. If there ever was a liminal space, the gang existing in a place outside of its designed context, this would be it. And everything is malfunctioning from concession stands to full rides, making the place hazardous. Isolation, danger, and liminality. It's the only episode of Scooby-Doo Where Are You that checks all those boxes simultaneously while having a horrifying monster and having a jump scare so good that they used it in the opening theme song. And that is what makes episode eight, Foul Play at Funland, the scariest episode of Scooby-Doo. Not according to me, according to this thing that I invented, but I'm passing the blame off. When you inevitably tell me that I'm wrong in the comments, at the very least, show your work, all right? This is a classroom now. We're in school. Ghoul school. <laughs> Anyway, if you want to hear my full and final thoughts about the Space Skull Man and why it used to be my favorite episode of this cartoon until uh, just a couple minutes ago when I changed it, then go check out patreon.com slash nerdsync and get in on that Scoobtober special offer if you support me at the $5 tier or higher. Again, you get like nine hours of exclusive audio commentaries about Scooby-Doo movies and TV shows. The special offer is ending in a couple days from this video, but you can support me any time of the year for any amount of money and I would appreciate it. It. You can join the rest of the wonderful nerds like, and I'm going to read the names from this list here, A Filthy Casual, Amanda Trisdale, BKBW, Christopher Lang, DeCassowary, Donna Bark, Edwin Latour, Eric Ketchum, Eric Dottora, Pato, Everett Parrott, Jeffrey Roscoe, Jack Fien, uh, Jonathan and Megan Pearson, Jonathan Lanowski, Casper Sieg, Mar Sodeldeen, Marisa Wilson, Pete Temple, that has an exclamation point at the end, so I have to say it like that, Silva Donut, and all of these other names on the screen right now. Like I said, any and all support on Patreon would be incredibly helpful, especially right now. To find out why, you can watch my previous video about how a pup named Scooby-Doo helped me work through some depression. I've also got a bunch of other Scoob videos you can watch. Once again, my name is Scott, reminding you to explore your favorite art through curiosity and vulnerability. See ya.